So, Berto, I'm on Discovery Plus because I watch reality TV, and that's where all the reality TV is, the 90 Day Fiancés and all that kind of stuff. Right. It's, it's on Discovery Plus. It's like the Netflix for that sort of television. Some people might call it trash television. And you're like, Berto, get, a, get another subscription added to your life. <laughs> yeah, and I saw advertised on there this Army Hammer documentary, and I thought, hmm, that might be interesting to watch, and I thought we could do an episode about it, but I remembered that a year and a half ago, we already did an episode about it, but from what I understand, there's a there's more information, which there was, because we both watched it, yeah. so I thought we'd get into more Army Hammer allegations and his life and psychopathy and vor fetish and BDSM yeah. and what the victims are saying and Me Too and also white privilege and the corruption of the system. It goes back, this story of Army Hammer goes back over a hundred years. Yeah, it's generational. And also we could talk about an update as to where they are legally. What do you say, Berto? Let's do it. This is East Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who My name is Umberto Castaneda and I'm a mental declassifier. So a major trigger warning, of course, because you know we're not going to talk about more than we need to, but to talk about this, we have to talk about some very severe behaviors and experiences. So if you have PTSD or you're triggered otherwise by this sort of talk, I would not listen to this episode. It's, not, it's probably not critical for your life to listen to it. So, all right. So Army Hammer has been alleged to have used BDSM as a gateway to actually raping and controlling and getting inside their minds where he can do anything he wants to them. And there are allegations from, if I just sort of lump all the allegations together, there's one woman that said that he raped her a number of times, but one time raped her for four hours. I think had her tied up and he was raping her and banging her head against the wall. And she, she gives an account of this and cries about it. Another woman said that he cut his name, his letter, his A, into her body as like a brand or something without her consent and but by you know by that point he had broken her down had had gotten inside of her head and had slowly acclimated her to not considering even her body to be her own you know it, it was this really slow progression you know after many weeks or months of that he, he could literally carve a into her side and it's obvious that the women all along were communicating in a variety of ways, I don't want to do this, or I'm not ready to do this. Like, that's part of it, obviously, yeah. for him. Even to such an extent that in some of the text messages where he is saying things like, you know, you took it like a champ. Yeah. The other person's saying, I was crawling and crying and screaming. Yeah. I wasn't ready for it. And yeah. he'd be like, well, you know, things worked out or something. If he wasn't a sexual sadist, he would be like, huh? Wait, what? I thought, I you, thought, you, I, I thought you wanted to do it. What like, a misunderstanding. Yeah, a true dom, this would be the biggest failure of their life. Like, they would be so ashamed and so bothered by it. Like, wait, so uh, I wanted to uh, watch this and talk about it because, and I was glad that we did because the documentary gives us a chance to further illuminate or illustrate what love bombing is and what this sort of perpetration is like, especially with Courtney. Give us a chance to really talk about how perpetrators can suck you in. Right. Because it can be hard to relate to if you've never been victimized by this. Yeah. From the outside, it's like, well, you consensually essentially did all these things. Yeah, how so, did you not see this coming? Yeah, what's wrong with you? Yeah. And uh, I think the more we talk about this, the better chance that people understand it and the better chance people will be able to protect themselves and the better chance that society will be able to stop blaming victims and actually take action against perpetrators to protect society. The other thing that this documentary provides us with is a lot of new information that I had no idea about. Yeah. Going back generations. A background, wow. <laughs> this like direct line of men, you know, Army's yeah. father, his father, his father, and his father. And his uncle. <laughs> all yeah. with this problem. So if you don't know who Army Hammer is, he was born in 1986, California. So he's about 36 right now. He's an actor. He was in The Social Network in 2010. He played both Winklevoss twins, if you remember. And then he was also in Call Me By Your Name and many other movies and yeah. TV shows. But he was this 
tall drink of water and a deep voice and a good actor. I remember thinking when I saw The Social Network that like being sort of caught off guard by him. I mean, I, I knew or at least imagined that it was probably not actual twins, but I couldn't be sure. They did a really good job with it. But I was like, who is this person? They seem like engineered for this movie like mm -hmm. in a lab like this is a superhuman <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah because he grew up in money yeah a lot of money like astronomical amount astronomic amounts of money astronomical amounts of money? astronomically astronomical amounts and that was the role he was playing yeah. and the the twins he was playing are tall good looking right. old money right he really nailed those characters and it really <laughs> propelled his career so then around 2020 allegations were coming out about him being abusive and then as those stories are coming out he was canceled he lost many of his movie roles yeah. he was dropped by his representation we did an episode in 2021 and then this documentary came out all right so what do you think rotten tomatoes gave this documentary bro let's see i think the critic score for the documentary was like 80 percent, 80 percent. and what do you think audience was audience uh 90 percent. critics are 57 Ew. which is according to rotten tomatoes not fresh Ooh, or a rotten tomato right it's a little rotten okay. audience is 21 percent well, trust me on my estimates then. <laughs> but why? Okay, so I, I, so I have a couple of ideas. As a documentary, uh, we, we've seen much better documentaries in the way that they're laid out and then the way that they're yeah. sort of paced and things like that. And this documentary, a lot of it was already basically known to a I lot of people. Yes, so, although the information is so important and compelling. But yeah. so I could see a critic docking it for those formatting audience that's a tricky one because I, I would have expected the audience to see past the fact that it's not that great of a structurally a, a documentary but but be like whoa what the heck so either do we have a whole bunch of like anti me too guys a and b do we have a lot of people grossed out by the whole story well a your spidey sense yeah. is good and i'll get into that more later it's not just anti me too it's like a very specific online group which i can't wait to talk about because it's very strange how many birdos out of 10 would you give it i was not super impressed i uh, but i would average it out with the value that i think this information provides so i actually would give it overall i'd give it an eight which is weird because it's like a six average with like a nine in value yeah. yeah, I think I gave it a six in terms of just its quality as a documentary. What I really liked about this documentary was two things. One is, is they got firsthand accounts yep. from not only people around Army Hammer, of course, because that's a major component of the story, but also firsthand accounts of people who were close to his father and his right. father's father and his father's father's father. And not only just first hand accounts, but like the family members who spent time with these people. Yeah. Wives and partners and kids of these men, you know? Oh, yeah. I could see now, now I'm realizing that's part of it. Like, I bet you a lot of people are like, oh, this is creating this narrative where like males are just bad in general. Uh, Every well, male's bad, always. Well, wait till we get yeah. to it. I, but but I, yeah, so for me, I, I think, you know, I said six and nine, they don't average to eight, but I still feel like. I got so much value out of this information. I wish it would have been packaged a little bit better. Uh, but it's it's three main points. One, look at what generational wealth can do, mm -hmm. right? That you can protect these horrible secrets and activities and things. Two, uh, look at what cycles of abuse can create, right? And then three, look at how essentially people with the right amount of privilege can really just get away with anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's called House of Hammer, by the way. The other really great thing about this documentary in my opinion is that it it clearly delineates between bdsm and what he was doing i loved that because yeah. i in fact i i believe i brought this up in our last thing and it would be natural to bring it up which would be but well, wait a minute people are into all sorts of kinky stuff now i personally i feel some of the texts are so beyond but whatever right 
But they're just texts, you know what I mean? I love that there were experts there right. talking about the actual acts and the lack of consent right. and the lack of this and that. Yeah. Yeah. What I didn't like about the documentary was they didn't fully portray how in love they were with him. I, I felt like that one documentary about that one con artist yeah. guy. That one did a good job. We did a whole episode about it, but it was, it's a Netflix documentary and it's about this Eastern, or no, a, a, an Israeli, Israeli guy yeah. in Europe. Anyway, point is, is that they had the victims, the two main victims, sort of act from a place of when they first met him. Yeah. You know, usually by the time they interview the victims, obviously right. they're, they're upset. They yeah, they, <laughs> they, they, they hate him. You know, they don't have any goodwill towards this human being. But they, the director effectively got these victims to go, okay, I want you to really go into the mindset. Yeah. Or the the victims just yeah. knew how to do Tell that. Tell us what it was like. And so for the first long stretch of the documentary, it sounds like a love story, you know, with this one woman. She's like, he was so romantic and so nice. And, and I loved him so much. And he made me, you know, and you're really in that world. And then when yeah. things take a turn, you're it's like you're going back in time and really going emotionally. Whereas in this documentary, they they talked about that for sure. But right. I, I could see someone who doesn't really read between the lines going like, so why were you with him? I don't understand. Now, what might be hard is the um, the documentary you're mentioning, the, the thing that happened to them was they were defrauded of so much money, right? It is possible that reliving... Tinder swindler. Oh, uh, yeah, the Tinder swindler. It is possible that reliving those feelings and those moments in, in full might be very re-traumatizing for these people because... I mean, totally. the thing they went through is like like a little mini hell, you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's yeah. legit PTSD that can develop yeah. and often does. And to recall the events and, and even to act like it, you were joyous when yeah, you first exactly. would, would really, you know, rip your brain apart to some extent. Also, there were times when they were going over just typical BDSM activity between the two of them. And they would play ominous music, you know. I was just, I just feel like, uh, you know, I guess it's for effect, and it probably works on a lot of people. But for me, I hear it and I go, "Stop doing that." Yeah. It's sort of like a comedian who makes a joke and then has this sign in the front that says, "Like laugh, laugh, laugh." It's right. like I'll laugh if I let, it, let the facts speak for themselves. Yeah. If the joke yeah. is funny, I will laugh. So at the end of episode 1, I believe, they end the episode asking the aunt if she was abused by her father. Yeah, sexually abused. Sexually abused. And this big cliffhanger. Yeah. And then they don't they don't come back to that till way into the second like towards yeah. the end of the second yeah, episode. Yeah, way later. And, and I'm like, well, first of all, that is very manipulative, but at least open with that in the next episode yeah. because but I don't know. I just didn't like the way they did that. Yeah. Because to me, these sorts of tactics are, I think, a throwback to a time when it wasn't streaming, where That's right. you had to uh, really manipulate people. them, yeah. Well, manipulate people not only to watch the next episode, but even just to get through the commercials. Yeah. And Discovery Plus for 90 Day Fiance, it does this as well. Like, you know, because Discovery Plus is like Netflix. There's no commercials. Okay, Berta, let's talk about love bombing because we're going to get into Army Hammers. I think that's great. I think the way you format these episodes is so fantastic. You're so awesome, Kirk. I just can't tell you how awesome you are. I will not way, fall for some, your manipulations. I need some money. <laughs> I, a while back, did a deep dive on love bombing and decided to define it. It's not very well defined, particularly online. And so I thought I would delineate between two different types. One is what is typically talked about, which is like, in which you could say Army Hammer is, is accused of doing, which is a conscious attempt to manipulate and control a person using grand dem demonstrations of affection. Okay. A conscious attempt to manipulate and control someone using grand demonstrations of affection often with psychopathic or sadistic abusers, which if we believe the allegations would describe Army Hammer. But it's a rare type because it involves, of course, psychopaths, sadistic yeah. people on these people on the spectrum. These individuals are extremely rare. According to the internet, it's like half of men are this way. Everyone's a narcissistic, malignant, psychopathic person. <laughs> but we know in our field that it's a pretty rare condition <laughs> We're talking on the order of 1%-ish, maybe two. So now, now, is love bombing something you could use as well for, like when we've talked about Amway or things like that, where they love bomb you? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. So love bomb can be used in a variety of contexts, romantic relationships, but also organizations, religions, cults. Yeah. They almost always use these high control or uh, gangs will use, churches will use love bombing. Absolutely. Again, in those organizations, it can be a conscious or a subconscious effort. You know, if you are totally in love with your church and you believe that your church is awesome and you believe that right. salvation is in that church and that people deserve to be loved and that if people haven't found God or been baptized or whatever hocus pocus someone believes in, <laughs> um, then you're going to reach out and you're going to say, Hey, I could, I could, I can give you eternal happiness in, instead yeah. of eternal damnation. So, and I love you so much and I want to help you. You know, they're not setting out to manipulate and control someone. Right. They, they, they think they're doing something really wonderful. So someone for Amway or Landmark or something could be similar, but sometimes those individuals also do know that they're manipulating and mm -hmm. do know that it's not necessarily in the best interests of the mark. That's it. So the second type is, in my estimation, my experience, way more common version of love bombing, which is a, a subconscious effort to gain attachment security through hasty and extreme affection. So it's really mm -hmm. quite different. Both involve extreme grand demonstrations of affection one is you're using it on purpose yeah. and that's what it seemed as though the victims were saying that army hammer was doing but for the vast majority of love bombing situations it's because the person is trying to gain attachment security sure and they might also be idealizing through borderline or some other condition they are actually seeing the other human being as perfect and yeah. all good and all wonderful I mean, that's, that seems like a lot of dating starts that way, right? <laughs> right. So what's the line between falling in love right. and love bombing? Where you're like, I've never met someone like you. And, yeah. and, like, and flowers are delivered and chocolates. And, yeah. you're like, and then you leave notes in the dark late at night in their, <laughs> uh, under their door. Oh, wait, that's too much. Well, you're kind of describing yourself. <laughs> yes. I mean, literally. Well, actually, so I definitely love bombed. Yeah. So, but, you know, that's also like what's shown in movies. It's like you gotta well, go crazy. You gotta go over the top. You have to do crazy gestures. So some signs that I came up with of love bombing is that they will choose vulnerable targets typically, uh, whether it's subconscious or not. Be, you know, so you, the the individual, if they're conscious of it, they actually might know how to find people that are easy targets. If it's subconscious, they might just be looking for anyone that will accept it or someone that they're attracted to. There will be a lot of compliments. They will communicate often. So think about what Courtney, the victim, yeah. was saying about Arby Non Nonstop text. Right. Yeah. They will move very quickly through the right. stages of the relationship, like very quickly. Introduce, introduce to parents. Yeah. They'll use the L word very quickly. They'll want to move in very quickly, this sort of thing. Right. They might offer to save you if you need to be saved. They push for commitment very quickly. You find yourself agreeing to things you wouldn't normally do. They don't react well when you try to slow down. They give you many gifts. You feel an unnamed fear of displeasing them. This is kind of a key. Yikes. Your friends say you've changed in a bad way. Uh -huh. They will talk crap about your exes and just people in your life. There might be a big age difference, but not always. But Army Hammer and that other woman, they had a pretty big age difference. Also, they get hurt easily. So not all the signs are going to be there, particularly those latter ones, but, um, but those are just some signs that I would frequently see. In terms of how they do it, uh, this is the, the sort of uh, progression. They shower with love. There's also big emotions like deep joy, deep sexual pleasure, deep sadness you know they will express deep sadness yeah. about their past huge displays of emotion they will move quickly you will feel obligated to please them this is actually a pretty big key so whatever you know when you fall in love with someone and or someone's falling in love with you and maybe you're not as in love with them as they're in love there's a a freedom to that that you will sense yeah if it's not love bombing, if, whereas if it is love, love bombing, you will feel trapped in a sense. And Interesting. Courtney was talking about that. She yeah, was talking yeah. about how 
when she would separate from him, when they just weren't together, she would feel this pit in her stomach yeah. when she thought of it. But, but it was cognitively dissonant because in her mind, she's like, <laughs> but he's perfect. Yeah, He's beautiful. He's rich. He's successful. He loves me so much. Huh. He's interesting. Every He's perfect. But I feel this pit in my stomach. And so that's something right. often one should listen to. Okay, so my list of how they do it that I came up with is that they will first shower you with love. They will also have big emotions, big joy, big happiness with you. When the two of you go to the beach, they're just like, this is the best beach of all time. When you go mm. to dinner, they're like, this is the best dinner and you're the best and I love you. And when they talk about their past, there might just be extreme sadness and crying. And there's just a lot of emotional content there. They will move quickly in the relationship. You'll often feel obligated to please them. This is actually a pretty big key when uh, trying to evaluate whether it's love bombing or not, because it's one thing for two people to be falling in love. It's it's another thing for one person to feel like, do I better go along with it? Otherwise, I think they're going to get upset. That's right. kind of the key to love bombing. See, up until that one, because I had a, a, a mild case of the first few categories you mentioned in high school in a relationship where I felt like things moved really quickly, like super quickly. And I, and I was showered with like how great I was in attention. And then just as quickly a little bit later i was dropped like a bad habit but i didn't feel the thing that that next category the one about like i felt obligated mm -hmm. so yeah yeah that's why it's it's kind of confusing sometimes am i falling in love with someone or am i being love bombed <laughs> right so to go on the list is you will become very enmeshed you will have a honeymoon period and then there will be distance they will betray you or they'll feel betrayed, uh, you know, and then there'll be a makeup phase and then the abuse cycle kind of kind of goes from there. That is if you don't or they don't cut it off with you from you. But a lot of abusive relationships begin with a love bombing phase. Again, whether it's conscious or subconscious depends on where it's coming from. So to answer your question, like what's the line between if someone is having healthy love right. and infatuation and compulsive attraction to somebody? You know, so we evolved to do that. What's the line between that and love bombing? Well, the key difference is, is that number one, the individuals who are infatuate, infatuated with you, they will respond well if you push back, if you draw a boundary. Mm. If you say something like, hey, I need a break this weekend, or my parents are coming to town and you know, I, I, I kind of wanted to spend time with them alone, or oh. you know what, tonight I have a work thing and so I'm gonna, people who are truly in love with you and not on the love bombing spectrum, will be bummed, but they're not going to get angry or right. or pressure or not let you, you know, obviously angry is pretty easy to detect, but a, a more subtle love bomber will say, totally fine. And then they'll text you 500 times that night. Oh that, like, yeah, I but, see. <laughs> but it won't be like controlling. It'll just be like, I miss you so much. I love you. And right. so it, then you feel kind of compelled the next time you're like, oh, maybe I should cancel my plans because. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And you'll probably text back throughout the night. And, right. And not really be present in the thing you were trying to. Right. Number oh. two is love bombers. Their love is conditional, meaning it's not unconditional, meaning that if you don't fall in line with their thing, then they will retract or maybe even fall out of love with you. And it's subtle because like with the way Courtney talked about Army Hammer, there was nothing in the beginning that indicated that he had any kind of nefarious intent or right. that he, his love was somehow uh, had stipulations. It was, you know, like the first thing she did was uh, where she first really noticed something was they, they go to the store and they're looking at ropes. Yeah. And uh, presumably there was some kind of conversation about BDSM, or probably really mild because he was. Well, he had asked, he had told her about, asked her if he knew about the Japanese thing and all yeah. those things. Really yeah. subtle, just like, hey, you know about this? Just, just dropping little hints here and there. Yeah. And she's not into that sort of thing. So she's like indicating at the store, at the Home Depot or whatever. Yeah, like, let's was, just go. <laughs> well, but she's indicating that she's not. She's not super into it. She's yeah. not really receptive. She's just kind of like, okay, well. And she doesn't want to upset him because you you don't typically want to upset the person you're in love with. You want to please them, right? Yeah. And so she just slightly indicates that she's not into it, and then he pulls back. But And then he goes down a different road, like, well, I do this and then i show her the secretary movie like, right right like i did with my previous victim and da 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 
which that's crazy, right? Like this this pattern. Like, yeah. It's like, oh, I will show this movie. I will right. bring up these topics. I will, you know. We'll go to this hotel. Yeah. We'll go to this restaurant. Yeah. Like so everything's the same. Yeah. So that points to a manipulative tactic, right? Because right. if you have borderline or histrionic and you're just haphazardly love bombing people, you wouldn't follow a prescription. <laughs> right. You know? Like this worked before. I'm going to follow the same recipe. Right. In fact, you probably wouldn't do anything similar because, you know, if you have borderline or histrionic or narcissistic, you actually look back on your previous relationships and it's not very pleasant to you. you right. Know what I mean? So, so and, you try and, to avoid and, that. That's right. And if you weren't doing any of these things nefariously at all, like let's say you, you were just showering people with affection because you wanted to or whatever, the previous relationship would probably still be hold some space in your heart. So you'd be like, well, I don't want to, like, that's what I did with that person. Like, I want to do new things. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so the unconditional part of it or the conditional part of it for Army Hammer wasn't revealed until later yeah. because at some point she he was being more upfront about the BDSM stuff. And of course, he didn't want to do BDSM. He wanted to actually abuse her sadistically. Yeah, And that's a key point that was discussed in the documentary that BDSM is always consensual. In right. fact, it's it's always or almost always in service of the submissives' fantasies, yeah, not the dominant's fantasy. Now, ideally, it's both pleasurable for the dom and the sub, but often the dom will be doing things not for their own sexual gratification. Sometimes it is that way, but often the sub is the one that's mainly being serviced. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? They're the one that's like, okay, I want you to tie me up. I want you to hit yeah. me with the cat of nine tails, and I... And of course, there's safe words and there's consent and lots of talk beforehand when you're doing it ethically. And then the dom is like, okay. And then the dom in their head is like, okay, I'll do that. And maybe the, the dom's like, well, I kind of like to do this thing, so I'll kind of throw that in there or I'll ask, is it okay if I throw that in there, that kind of thing. But typically, it's all about the sub's wishes. It's all been laid out, or at least right. the, the, the outline of the whole thing. <laughs> And the dom is like, okay, I'll do it, and I like it. I, I love giving someone else pleasure, but at some point, we're going to turn this around, and they're going to do something for me. You know, right. it, It's their turn now, yeah. and then later it's my. So it's completely the opposite, right, with Army Hammer, at least the allegations, was that it had nothing to do with, with, what, the, they with, wanted. with the, what the women wanted. Right. And that's the other part of this, is that there are plenty. Do you know how many subs out are, you know, like people who f love to be dominated and tied up, sure. they get massively off on that. Do you know how many attractive women would want Army Hammer to sure. do this to him? Yeah. To, to do this to him? So he would have no problem. He would have women lining, not all women, but yeah. so if he was really looking for right. a dom sub BDSM relationship, he would have no problem. But that was obviously not the point. The point was to break these people. That, yeah. It not only break them, but also the way he talked about in these texts. Um, and that's the other thing. Like, he was just out in the open texting right. uh, these crimes. Like, I, it made me feel so powerful when you were yeah. it, it, crawling away, crying. Like, yeah. what? Yeah. Yeah. He, he, I, we'll get to the exact text later. But essentially, like, that mom moment when you didn't want any of these things to happen and you were crying and sobbing on the ground and telling me not to do it, th and I was standing over you, that's when I, f that was the best feeling of my life. I've never felt like that before. I felt like a god. I felt like I could do anything. And he's texting this, yeah. and it's it's a matter of record. Like if you go to the phone company, they will confirm in all likelihood, yeah. yes, that's what was sent from his phone. So that's what he was going for. He wasn't going for BDSM. That's right. what he used as a way of, sucking people in. He's like, well, it's, this is just some light BDSM, no no biggie. And he had the impression, at least implicitly, that he can do that because what what's going to happen? Yeah, which what's we'll get into in it, which we'll get into in a bit, you know, about his generational lessons. So with Courtney, she talks about how he was pushing for BDSM. He wasn't pushing for BDSM, but that was his gateway situation. 
And at some point she didn't really push back, but she had to be a little bit more firm of just like, yeah, it's not really my thing. And then he got angry, like, and, mm. and then she felt bad, right? Because just imagine, you know, love, love, I love you, you're the best, you're, I wanna be with you forever, you know, rich and fame and education and connections and, and romance and he knows me and he's emotional and he's available and he's affectionate and physical and everything's perfect and oh no, I did something to upset them. In normal circumstances, yeah. you would be like, oh crap, right? like what am I doing? Yeah, like why did I do that? I'm always screwing. And you socialize women to please men and to not think about themselves. Yeah. And then you treat them like crap. And then, of course, if you've been through gender-based or even just non-gender-based uh, victimization that uh, acclimates you to or that you walk away from those experiences thinking, well, I deserved it or something, then you're in a situation like that. You're being love-bombed and then you, you push back slightly and you're just like, and then he's uh, he's displeased with you, and you're just like, "Oh no, I screw!" And, the, and that's all part of yeah. the grooming process. Now, the word grooming, I just want to talk a little bit about because I think I've said contrary things in the past. So, you know, for the longest time, as a clinician, we only used the word grooming when it came to kids. Oh, really? Okay. It was the classic grooming scenario where you have a neighbor or sure. or an uncle or an aunt or something who knows they're going to eventually abuse that child. Yeah. It doesn't just sort of randomly happen, but they will suck in not only the child, but also the family. So they'll come across. So a classic example is Larry Nasser from... Oh, the is that the gymnastics? Yeah, the gymnastics oh. trainer in California, Michigan. Right? No, I oh. think it was Michigan, Michigan okay. State. Uh, don't quote me on that. And he was the doctor, right? Like the yeah, yeah, physical uh, doctor that would work on the Olympic gymnasts, right? Including all the famous Olympic. And you know they happen to have tons of hip misalignments, apparently. Right. Well, and they really do, honestly. Yeah. I mean, that to be a gymnast at that level, your body is constantly sure, yeah, <laughs> being torn apart. You know what I mean? And so even anyway, so you could argue he even became a physician so that he could abuse people. Right. And then of course he becomes a physician that works with young women and girls, children. And then he gets involved, you know, he works really hard to get involved in the most elite gymnast organization, yeah. perhaps you could say in the world. Yeah. Because who knows, but one could one could either unconsciously or consciously if you're him know that these girls are going to need a lot more physical attention. They're also maybe used to being compliant because to be at that level of yeah. a gymnast, you can't think about your feelings. No, and it's more likely that they're not supervised the whole time. Because look, right. think about it. They have to be dropped off at practice constantly. Yeah. And there's tons of kids, tons of girls, so that everyone's running around. No one's paying attention to stuff because mm -hmm. it's busy. Yeah, it seems like a perfect storm of bad and situations. The, I mean, just imagine you, Berto. Let's say your two daughters, they, for some reason, they get into gymnastics and then a coach suggests they do an elite program and they right. do that and things are escalating and then th things get to the point where uh, they're very good at it and now they're faced with a scenario where it's basically like every waking hour, even maybe school time, is spent on this extremely physically and grueling physically you know, grueling situation right. that, you know, in the end probably won't amount to anything. Uh, I'm just, I hope as a parent, you'd be like, yeah, nah. Right. <laughs> like, let's let this kid have a childhood. Wait, are you saying my kids can't go to the Olympics? <laughs> yeah. Now I'm going to prove you wrong. <laughs> so it, it also takes a particular kind of parent or at least a parent right. that has made some serious sacrifices, which could indicate that the parent's have their priorities askew a little bit. I don't want to accuse all the parents of that, but that's another possible factor. Anyway, so then not only all that career grooming to get close, but then he was the nicest and the best and all the parents loved him and the coaches loved him, the oh, gymnasts yeah. loved him. And, and then the girls would come into his office and at first he didn't do anything. And so there'd be, you know, maybe dozens of 
of physicals and help and you know he studied on it and he became a super expert on all this stuff and and then it would begin yeah you know and he's got great results to go with it meaning like you know people that see him do better they heal faster whatever right like he's got the data to show that he's good yeah he's like (laughs) one of the leading researchers and 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 he gives ted talk kind of things oh my gosh and and then once it's and then of course the emotional grooming that he would do to the girls and a lot of the girls would report that he was their guardian and you know their their knight in shining army because the coaches would be pushing 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 and then he'd come along and he'd just be nice and hey give him a break and you know he was this savior in a lot of ways and then that's when the so that's like a very exaggerated version a real version yeah. of grooming that's typically what we mean by grooming and also, I started hearing people applying it to adult relationships where someone would say, and this is, this is not uncommon to hear in this context, and, you know, spoiler alert, it's, this is not considered grooming by anyone in the, met, in the clinical field. But someone's like, yeah, I met this guy on Tinder, and we uh, hit it off, and he, you know, was texting me all the time, and he, but, you know, he was grooming me. And then, for what? Uh, well, <laughs> and then he, uh, you know, just insert a bunch of little details here of like mild love bombing, uh-huh. and then and say they never even had a physical, they right. never touched, they never had sexual right. encounters at all, and then one day he just like texted me that he didn't want to see me anymore. I mean, he he love bombed me, he groomed me, he was a malignant narcissist, like wow. like no joking. There are stories <laughs> that have that little detail, but then, it <laughs> and the and the woman right. was groomed. Groomed. Now, did something nefarious happen? Maybe, but yeah. that's not grooming. <laughs> you know, it, now you could say manipulated, but even then, it's like, are you know, how do you know? But sure. But why not just use the word manipulate? Like you're going to claim that what you went through is the same thing that Simone Biles went through with Larry Nasser, like yeah. you're you're giving yourself that much yeah, yeah. weight to what happened to you. So normally I would say, and I think I might have said, we don't want to use grooming for adults. Having said that, I think using it in a situation like this with Army Hammer, particularly because the way it looks, according to the allegations, is that this was conscious, purposeful, sure. Machiavellian, planning of manipulation through a whole set of things, potentially never actually having loved or had any affection for any of these women. It was right. it was a long con, you know? It is really hard to know what's in someone's head, of course. Right. But there really didn't seem to be that, at least that level of empathy of like, hey, okay, I see you're, is this too much? Like, is this... Maybe 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 I should back off. That was never a question. It's like I'm gonna push this till till I get you know till it ruins something. <laughs> right till it till it. I push them so far. Yeah. That I either have to commit what I think to be a crime, or it has to end. Yeah. You know I it's I don't think I thought about that because he obviously could have gone further when you think about the Bill Cosby allegations, right? Right. Because. So, long story short, let's take a break, Berto, because it's been a while. Yeah, let's do it. All right, we're back from the break. I feel like we've been all over the map. I'm I'm, I'm completely off script, Berto, in terms (laughs) of my outline. But to cut to the chase, there's this thing called sexual sadism. And for these individuals, they are sadistic in that they take pleasure in other people's pain. They either want to inflict that pain or discomfort or distress themselves or they just like watching people go through it like sadists will really get a lot of pleasure and so general sadism it's not necessarily sexual it's just a a feeling of pleasure and joy like and well actually paul our friend drummer posted on facebook which apparently you only use for political trolling but um and spouting but if you actually use facebook for how it's supposed to be used Berto, just joking i mean i i lately lately meaning the last year or so all i do is every now and then i open it i see if any one of my friends has posted something oh. and i like or comment okay yeah well last time we posted. talked two weeks ago you said you didn't even do that anymore 
I'm not doing it often. That's true. I don't but, do but, it but sometimes. Okay. But I do. Yeah, okay. I've, I've liked and commented on some things. Because I don't do it very often either. Yeah. Maybe once every two days, I'll kind of look at... Like I saw you posted some sort of record, and then Paul commented, hey, that's a great band. And you're like, you like the band. You should check out the bassist or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I saw that. Well, we were joking. Well, okay, yeah. Today, I... So I've been buying up all my old vinyl, yeah. right? Which isn't cheap. And I bought Super Unknown by Soundgarden. I was listening to it, so I just posted a video of it. Anyway. Yeah. And so Paul actually posted a picture of his two cats. He has a black cat and a white cat. Aww. They were laying down facing each other. <laughs> the white cat was licking the black cat's forehead. Aww. And the black cat was like being very still because you could tell that the black cat really liked that, you know? Aww. It went on for a long time and I watched that whole thing twice and I was extremely, <laughs> I had a lot of joy. Okay, for sadists, yeah. they get that same pleasure when they see or they do themselves harm other people. Oof. So that's some that's yeah. some crossed ri- wires right there, yeah. right? A sexual sadist will manifest that sadism through sexuality. Again, either watching someone get raped, coerced, harmed right. during sex against their will, because if it's actual BDSM, it's not actual harm. Right. In fact, the the sub enjoys it. Yeah. They want to be tied up. They want to be, you know, spanked. <laughs> you know, they want the, they want to be talked down to. It's consensual and within the realm of what they can control. Yeah. Yeah. So with sadists, that's the opposite of what they want. They don't yeah. want because that's not su- painful. That's not. I mean, painful in the spiritual way. That's not like harming them. That's not. Right. Yeah. It's not against the, the person's will. And so the sadist wants the opposite thing. And so we've known about this for a long time. And it's sadism, and then a sub a subtype of that is sexual sadism. Uh, it seems as though Ted Bundy was a sexual sadist. Oh my um, gosh! A lot, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, these yeah. kinds of people. Yeah. Because you have people who are serial killers, and then you have people who are serial killers who rape. Right. And then you have people who are just serial rapists, but they don't kill. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's different classifications and. There's various different reasons for this. Do you remember I I told you uh, in this podcast one time I talked about, or many, many times maybe, uh, when I was really little, uh, I was in Boston, Massachusetts, sorry, somewhere, and I was at a house where downstairs uh, me and my little friend were playing, and the grandma of the, my little friend tried to really scare us, like turned off the lights to the basement and made some really spooky, scary sounds. Hmm. And I, I remember, I have the, I mean, I'm, probably three or four at the time or something I, i'm like little and i have the memory of her at the top of the stairs freaking the hell out of us um what happened was when my first daughter was little i all of a sudden noticed i had an impulse to scare her mm-hmm. and i had to really like you know question myself i'm like what the because it was a, sad, a sadistic impulse yeah it's interesting i don't know if i've ever thought about it because all the disorders, especially these ones, a model of thinking about it, which is the one that I use, is that they are exaggerated qualities of of all of our characters. Yeah, you know, we all have a little borderline in us. We all have a little narcissism in us. I've never thought, do we all have a little sadist in us? And uh, and we do because when we like to prank someone, right, and scare them, yeah, right? that's a level of sadism. But I think the typical normal level of sadism is that we will want to scare someone but the the pain or the discomfort for the victim or the person the the target is brief and quickly relieved do you know what i mean i'm not a big pranker for a lot of reasons one i don't think i'm particularly good at it (laughs) you know like when i was in high school I was like, oh yeah, April Fool's Day, I'll do one. <laughs> and I, I'm just I'm just terrible at it. I either do too little or too much, and this one time I did too much. I went up to my parents and, and my mom, uh-huh. and I said, um, oh, by the way, mom, my girlfriend's pregnant. <gasps> oh no, not a good one. <laughs> and my mom, uh, you know, she's just stunned. She doesn't know what to say. Uh-huh. And then I'm like, haha, April Fool's. Oh my God. Gosh. And the look on her face, like she wasn't angry, but I just remember thinking, that was really bad. <laughs> like, what was I thinking? Like, I didn't yeah. think it through. Yeah, yeah. And I think since then, I I just have never liked it. And when people prank me, especially if they go too far, I, I'm always like, this isn't really worth it. You know, there's so many other ways to have yeah. fun with people. 
and uh, and you set up a a expectation of of someone sadistically messing with you that I I just don't want to spread that around. You know, yeah. if, if people want to do that, to, you know, if Matt Damon and Jimmy Kimmel want to do that to each other, and that's their thing, you know. But like you and I, we don't prank each other no. like ever. Like, and I I stopped doing April Fool stuff because I I used to do them when I was young at work and it. It was like I had a lot of fun with it. I used to be good at it too, but there was one year where I sent an email and everyone, there was too many people that were like, that's not funny, you know? And so I was like, okay, all right, I'm done. <laughs> well, you remember what you did to the podcast? Oh, I do. I did. Actually, I, that came up the other day, or I saw it the other day. You saw like, it? What do you mean you yeah, saw it? Yeah, because I went on the, fan, on the fans of Facebook or on the podcast page on Facebook and maybe it was because I made that post, it was pinned to the top. And so it was. That right should be there. deleted, my friend. It was in there. Oh, yeah. Maybe I, I left it. So anyway, tell the story. Right. So yeah. So I, I went in and I wanted to make a a post that was appropriate for April Fools. So what I did is I went in and said that you know the podcast was ending essentially, and I was talking about like, oh, we regret to inform. Well, that. so so <laughs> to lay this out a little bit more specifically, back then Berto was an admin of our official Facebook page. So when he posted this, it came from the, the official. Right, right, right. It didn't say um, Umberto. Right. It said Psychology in Seattle is making this announcement, and right. it, and. And normally, I'm the one that was posting from that, so they figured it must have been from me. It must have been official. And by the way, this is back when we were much smaller. Yeah. So it felt a little more like, I don't know, like two people. <laughs> I was pranking two people. Not really. It was more than that. But yeah, so I was like, you know, it's it's been a good run, but you know, it's time. And I, I put enough hints in there to where- No, you didn't. Oh, I did. I did. There, if someone was paying attention, they'd be like, wait, what? <laughs> if someone was paying attention, no. Your, your inside, inside layered jokes within that post were- uh, uh, you know, reasonably not understood by a large swath <laughs> of the viewing audience. Fair enough. There were a lot of people that were honestly pranked. At least half the point. And it wasn't a prank like I broke my leg, podcast hiatus for two weeks. You were literally saying their favorite thing in the world was you know, ending. Not to toot our own horn but you know there are some people right. even back then who consider this to be their most important content provider and not just right. content like news it was like psychologically critical for them and so uh you you did this post you don't tell me um later that day i think stacy or someone said did you see that post or on your facebook on your facebook official page and i'm like huh and i look at it and my and I look at the comments and my heart just drops. And I'm like, one, what a shitty thing that these people went through this. Two, that you would do this without asking me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you would just like put it out there. Three, a big part of my goal of the podcast was to try to garner audience, right? right? In my head, I'm like, well, how many people are like, well, I'm done with this BS, and they just turn away. I mean, I'm sure that didn't happen, but you know, all this sort of thought was going through my head. I mean, this is, by the way, it was not unusual for, there's many channels that I do, that I follow, that do this or worse things on April Fool's. So I was like- yeah. But not us. We've literally <laughs> never done, we had never right. done an we April had never Fool's. Done it, yes. We don't prank our audience. Like, yeah, if, if you're watching some prankster, you know, but- I'm sure Mr. Rogers didn't pull a April Fool's joke on his kids on one of his shows. Like that just, that's not our style. It's sure. not what we do. I mean, all's well that ends well. But anyway, I immediately removed you from admin so you could never do that again. And that was a long time ago. But anyway, so what, if, prior to posting that or thinking as you're about to scare your kids, what is that? Because well, I think that's a very normal. Different, very different things. One is, I honestly think, that I was traumatized from that experience. Yeah. Think about at an age where fiction is real. Yeah. And so for a moment, I actually thought ghosts were attacking us in that basement. Yeah. And it was embedded and blazing in my head. So I think I was traumatized. Yeah. And and I had this impulse to I'm like, and and I was like, what do I, I want to so, so scare just, my child? So an asterisk. So let's really yeah. drill on this. So as an asterisk on this, army the implication and there's no direct evidence of this is that army hammer's father did this sort of thing or exposed this sort of thing to army it's not just 
the fact that there's a genetic component because right. this sort of thing seems to have about a, a 50% heredity, not meaning that. So let me drill down on that for a second. <laughs> this is a long asterisk. <laughs> okay. So when we say that something has 50% heritability, do you know yeah. what that means? Because it's kind of confusing. I feel like it would mean that half of its explanation can come from uh, DNA and the other half would be socialized. Right. And how would that play out? So say Army Hammer's father yeah. was a psychopath and a sadist. What's the chance that Army himself will be a psychopathic sadist? I don't know, because I don't think you mean that it's a 50% chance he will be, right? No. I just feel like if he were, we could maybe explain partially because he was abused. Exactly. Well, yeah. n well, no, because he had a genetic... Sorry, be sorry because he was genetically predisposed. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If he did have, you know, if we could, in fact, diagnose the father as a psychopath and or a sadist, and Army Hammer also was a psychopathic sadist, then we could not necessarily conclude about Army Hammer himself, but right. we could apply the... Because essentially where we get that 50% from is that when you have identical twins who are raised in different households and you find that one of the kids is 35 years old at this point and is a psychopathic sadist, there's a 50% chance that the other person will also be a psychopathic sadist. And so the... Right. So, so you have, say, a hundred groups of twins that where one of the members is a psychopathic. We'll just skip, you know, just stick to psychopathy because this is how it's really, because there's not a lot of research on sadism, honestly, because it's pretty rare. That, so, uh, you know, a hundred, you know, single twins are psychopaths. 50 of those other twins in other homes are also, are also psychopaths. So the idea is, is that, well, that's, you know, because if you take um, other kinds of things, you know, like you take the color of your eyes, yeah. okay? So identical twins and a hundred have blue eyes. Well, a hundred of the other twins will also have blue eyes. Right. Maybe if you took 10,000, there'd be like one or two that would have some genetic abnormality that yeah. would cause the other kid not to have blue eyes. But so you would say that blue eyes are a hundred, or the color of your eyes is a hundred percent that's heritability yeah. okay psychopathy is 50 percent. or if you said something like how much money you make in your lifetime right you take twin studies and i don't know what the percentage is but it's far lesser than 50 percent because yeah, yeah. that's not typically or at least according to research it's not a genetic there's not a, a strong genetic component you could say there's a genetic component to iq yeah. or emotional regulation or something that that could maybe attribute but of course how much money you make is dependent on community you grow up in, your education, your parents, their connections. You know, there's so many, the color of your skin, there's so many other things that are related to how much you make money. So, so the fact that his parents, or the fact that this, his dad and his dad's dad and his dad's dad's dad and his dad's 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 dad all show signs of psychopathy does not mean that Army Hammer had a strong likelihood of having psychopathy. Yeah. And we're also not sure any of them were psychopaths. We right. just have evidence to indicate that. Right. They I'm might. just, I'm yeah. just sort of, yeah, yeah. but you know, for the sake of hypotheticals, it's possible. And so, they were and, and those are twins. So it's right. 50%. Those are a DNA identical, almost right. identical people, you know, not including epige epigenetics, of course, but the amount of DNA you share with a parent is 50%. So, and the way that it mixes with your other parent, you know, there's a lot of, you know, changes to the way things are fitting together genetically. Anyway, so the my point is, is that Army must have been through some stuff yeah. <laughs> to socialize him, not only to the notions of psychopathy that it's okay or it traumatizes him, similar to you. So that's right. my big asterisk is like you and went through, a, you were psychopathically, sadistically traumatized right. by this by this event. And thus you recreated it, not because you're a right. psychopath, but because it was injected into you, which is kind of right. weird, right? It's not intuitive. Why would, you, if you were victimized, and that, and it wasn't a plan that you had, it was an urge right. that you had to fight against. That I actually had to like analyze and really think, what is So this? what is that? Why would you do that? Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think if I were to conceptualize it, it would be there's something familiar about it. Mm -hmm. okay. And so that's one thing is it's familiar. it's familiar. It's like so much of what we do as parents is 
because of familiarity. It's like these little phrases or attitudes. Yep. They just sort of fly out of us because it's what we saw. We, always, we, yeah. we are we are mimicking species. So that's but one factor. That's one. It's familiar. But then there is something else, which because I remember feeling like they, they you know it, to put it in words it, there would be an emotional reward for me from doing it mm. you know like it, of course all this is in the blink of an eye it's like an impulse i'm like why do i want to scare my child mm. be, but something it's like oh you should totally do this scary thing so you were predicting a pleasurable outcome by yeah. terrorizing your child yeah which which scared me you know i was like Wow. So why, so presumably if you had never been through that traumatic experience as a kid, you would not predict pleasure inside of you. Right. Uh, by, you know, at that plan in your head. Okay, I'm going to turn off lights, terrorize my kid. You wouldn't think that will be pleasurable to me. Do you think it would have been if you hadn't really stopped and think thought about it? Do you think there might have been a little pleasure if you Absolutely. actually? Absolutely. So yeah. that's weird, right? Like Very bizarre. How does an experience like that actually connect sadism harming of other people right with actual pleasure not just the idea of pleasure like oh this is what we do to have pleasure it's like no actual like brain chemistry that's like flooding your brain with you know nice neurochemicals saying you know dopamine and all this reward stuff it's like yay you just did something good like why would that have happened do you think yeah um you think it'd be the opposite <laughs> you know yeah the, the only thing i can think of is in that moment there must have been something registered, something stored in my brain, mm -hmm. connecting the context with the strong emotion. And that that doesn't get translated to the strong emotion of fear and panic necessarily, but just strong emotion. Mm -hmm. And so that then later, if I recreate the context, I might actually have that a strong emotion, which in this case feels pleasurable. Hmm. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just saying, like, the, the the only thing I can think of is that something gets stored and then gets misinterpreted by your brain, you know, mm -hmm. like, not yeah. consciously, just like, oh, you know, broom, drawer, open drawer, extract thing. Oh, interesting, strong emotion. Oh, yeah, this is strong emotion. Let's do that. Right. <laughs> and I think this is the a key question that they don't really mull over in the army hammer discussion because you know especially in this documentary they clearly lay out that like he was kind of doomed in a sense i mean yeah. if if you're looking for because it wasn't just as that he also was, saw stuff from his grandpa and his uncle <laughs> and his great-grandfather yeah i don't know how much he experienced from that but yes but know. i mean in terms of the passing down right, of the totally. behaviors you yeah. know and so uh if he wasn't a, a psychopathic sadist it would be weird like why how did it skip him you know what i yeah. mean so and so many people are like this, and I think one of the only reasons why we even know this is because they they are so famous because they were so rich that we actually have documented. You know, his great grandfather was on Johnny Carson. Yeah. <laughs> so we have all these uh, accounts and interviews and stuff. Whereas you take someone like Ted Bundy, who his father we don't even necessarily know who his father was. Right. It, it could have been this random guy that his mom bumped into, or it could have been his own grandfather that was his father. So these people seem to come from nowhere. <laughs> right, so there's no, and there's certainly you don't have interviews with these yeah. individuals going back three generations. Right. Anyway, so this is a central question. My hypothesis it, it has been that, and it's, it's not, I don't feel great about this hypothesis because it doesn't make a lot of sense, but in that moment, you see, who, who is this person to you? Uh, she was the grandma of a little friend. Okay, your friend's grandma. So yeah. your friend's grandma is you know you're downstairs is coming down the stairs and you're she's like, at the top of the stairs and you're in the basement and we're in the basement playing and this is in new york or in massachusetts massachusetts and she looks at you and she's like huh what did she do she flicked off the lights and made some really scary ghost sounds so ooh, something like did that. you see her or did you not see her well when we looked up we saw like the outline and then we saw then she turned back the lights and like I, what I don't know is, was it one of these like, woo, I'm just scaring you guys, or was it like really malicious? But the way it felt to me yeah. was malicious. Like I was genuinely terrified. Yeah, you had a massive panic reaction. Yeah. And it should be noticed, you noted that you were what, like three at the time? I was really little. <laughs> so that you remember it so well. And, and by the way, just a quick comment that my other experiences with grandmas were so loving and caring. Yeah. 
that I couldn't conceive of one of my other grandmas yeah. doing something like that. <laughs> so that might even kind of fit into my model. So uh, grandma, who you are normally very open to and also generally absorbing of their personality traits. Right. Because we are programmed to attach and also to mimic and also to become like. You know, I, I think we often underappreciate how much of our personalities are essentially just copying just just the version of them that we see. Of course, it's not them, but it's the version. But we're just photocopying characteristics. And what I what I always point to is our native language. Whatever native language we speak, yeah, is obviously no one taught us the language. They just right. did it, and we copied it. Not only do we copy the vocabulary, right. but we copy the syntax, which is pretty complicated. Yeah. We also copy the micro movements of hundreds of muscles in our tongue yeah. and mouth and to face. To such a degree that in some languages like Chinese, if you didn't get it, you can never get it. Right. Like if, if, you, if you go past a certain age and you try to speak Chinese without an accent, you can't because you can't even hear right. the differences. <laughs> and more broadly, one's accent, right? Yeah. Point is, is that you're open to your grandma, you're open to grandmas, this grandma comes down and you're like, oh, nice old grandma lady. She flips off the thing, she makes noises, you have a panic reaction. Whether it was vicious or not, doesn't really matter, you, you perceived it as such. You yeah. must have perceived it as she meant to terrorize me. It was really, the, the way it was done, because you know, my uncles and my dad and stuff, they, they always played with us kids in very non-threatening ways that were still like, you know, they'd do a hot dog rough house where they'd roll us up in a cushion or a blanket or something. Like, we would do Or they might come around the corner and go boo. Boo and be yeah. like, ha ah. yeah. ha. But it was never, this felt so different. This felt it like- pr Probably was. Legitimately like you're trying to terrify us. Probably was, but- impossible to really know yeah. point is is that you perceive it as such and so not only did you have this massive panic reaction that's just the dominant in the moment experience but you encoded the entire experience right you not only encoded the terrier going through and the discomfort and the terribleness but you also encoded like that's you know she must have taken pleasure in that yeah like a, a more a general or more common experience might be something like, well, with food, for example, yeah. where, you know, I love kimchi. Uh, I have come to learn that most white Americans think kimchi is disgusting. Even when you just, <laughs> even when you just open the, right. the jar, they'll be like, that's not, that smells like dirty yeah, socks. The first time I was exposed to kimchi, I thought it was someone's idea of an April fool's joke. <laughs> but I, you know, I was born in a house right with an open kimchi jar in it. Yeah. So it's just a part of, it's not only a just regular to me, it actually, it, it, it. it smells very right. appetizing to me. So you take a kid who is three years old, say they've never had kimchi, and they observe their parents enjoying kimchi. They're just like, oh, this is so great. And you, not only do you encode just, you know, uh, the memory, but you're also, because of empathy and our ability to really mentalize what's going on inside someone else's mind, when we're highly attuned to this, you can imagine that we're evolved to be this way because in order for us to survive, we almost have to adopt the associations of our elders, right? right. If they think snakes are scary, we have to Internalize just take that, their yeah. word for it, but we can't just learn it. We have, to, it has to be, their emotions and their associations have to be directly downloaded into my brain. And so you're looking at so many kimchi and, and, and evolutionary wise that indicates that it's safe and nourishing and will help my survival. And so thus, before I even ever have kimchi, I already love kimchi because it's my right. first set of associations and I'm absorbing it from my attachment figure. So you're looking at the grandma and she is taking pleasure in the terrorizing of young children. That's yeah. how you encode it. And so you evolved to adopt that. Just It just gets downloaded. Like when people, when you are causing someone else's stress and fear, yeah. then you will feel pleasure. And thus, without ever having done it before, right. you're already, you already have a sadistic uh, quality, slight yeah. sadistic quality. And... As you're about to terrorize your kids, you have this urge, you're predicting pleasure because it probably would have felt pleasurable. So then imagine you did it because you didn't check in with yourself right. and it rewards this 
behavior, right. and then you want to then do you more of it. To, yeah, which is how cycles happen, these cycles of abuse and everything. This is how sadism yeah. and psychopathy gets passed down through the generations. Right. You don't need a genetic component. It, it could help help yeah. you know, make someone susceptible to this. Along those lines, he, you know, a, a model of understanding how psychopathy exists is that, well, let's take a break and we get back, we'll talk a little bit yeah. more about that. All right, back from the break. So a model of understanding how psychopathy exists, and I've talked about this before, so I won't bore people with it, is that some people are born with a deficient amygdala, a a fear center. And so for these kids, and there's probably other factors as well, but just going down this, this road, for these kids, one, they don't experience danger in the same way that that other people do. And so they will take a lot of risks and even to their own you know, disadvantage. Which, which, by the way, like there's so many examples of that in this story, right? Of like, like in his case, like total disregard for what it means to send all those open texts and all these things. Like, yeah, no, no care in the world, but not, pro- probably not just because of the wealth and power, but also because of that lack of fear. Mm-hmm. Right. And in that interview that they show when he's on, I think, yeah. Jimmy Fallon or something, and he's like, yeah, my wife thinks I have an underdeveloped frontal lobe. Yeah. She says that I have no sense of danger yeah. and of safety, and um, I, you know, my brain is underdeveloped, right. and he's just sort of laughing about it. And, and so it's possible that he was born genetically with this issue, and thus uh, another aspect of our development <laughs> Because, you know, typically the way we talk about altruism or not harming other people, like the refrain that we all, or us non-psychopaths and non-sadists have around don't punch someone in the face out of just out of nowhere. Don't push people down the stairs, right? Right. Don't lie to people, these kinds of things. Well, we usually frame that as, well, that's because that's what it means to be good and, and that's what is good. Um, I mean, of course, religious people say it's because God is, you know, you're following God, but, you know, non-religious explanations are just like, we treat other people the way we want to be treated. Yeah, because of the fear. <laughs> but but it could be argued that the reason why, at least a major component of why we do those things is because we fear being right. punished for harming other people. And, it, and we're not necessarily born with that. We learn when we're two years old and we say throw a rock at our sister and the sister starts to cry yeah. and mom comes over and just it has a big reaction not doesn't abuse us but it's just like what did you just do you threw yeah. a rock at your sister and it startles you and if you have a regular fear response you're like oh my god i upset someone and then you encode that you associate all that like i harmed someone and something very dramatic happened that i didn't like my mom kind of really reacted and you rinse and repeat that enough times and the next time you want to throw a rock at sister you actually refrain because you don't want to have that thing happen that usually happens whereas if if you don't have any kind of fear then you, you never get an opportunity to make that association and even the the mirror image of what you were describing with the with my encoding of the situation in the stairs with the grandma, the mirror image for a little child can also be even without the mom coming and yelling at me. If it's a normal development, or you know a more standard development, it could be that even just seeing the other person in distress could encode something for me. Going like, oh, action caused distress. Oh, I'm afraid of distress. Okay, don't do action. Do you know what I mean? Like we we might have that because because the the brain just always correlating, always correlating, mm. and we just saw what we recognize similar to what happens when we're hungry or or when our knee gets hurt or whatever in this other person when I threw this rock. So subconsciously, I'm just gonna record that as like, oh, okay, if I do actions like this, it seems to cause that pain. Ooh, and I don't like pain, so maybe. Maybe I don't do those actions, but it, but if it does, that if that gets short circuited by any number of reasons, then I don't learn that lesson. Well, my hypothesis, which I'm liking more and more as I sort of say it, so God knows, but is that you're not just looking at the victim. So you see, you're at the playground, you see you see two kids, and one kid throws a rock at the other kid, and you know you notice. I, th- I think we tend to focus on the victim, right? The victim is having something thrown at their head, and we're like, "Ooh, that's bad! Don't throw." So, but we're also looking at the kid who threw the rock, right? Yeah. So what what do we think is happening on the inside of the kid? With but the rock? Th- that's what I'm saying. I'm I'm basically drawing a parallel to what the analysis you did about me 
somehow inferring pleasure yeah. from the grandma's pleasure yeah. to me somehow inferring pain from the other child's pain without even my mom having to yell at me. Uh-huh. And, and so it's like you would think, normally you wouldn't think that I would associate my pain just because I witnessed someone else's pain. You wouldn't think that, right? Like you would think I would have to suffer directly. No, no, we we right, yeah, right. But I'm saying, like, I think I like your generalized model I that see. you were describing, and you're, in, right. in that, yes, of course, if the mom comes and yells at me, now it just doubled down on that and said, not only might you have recognized that that pain was over there, but guess what? You also got pain directly, so learn it even better. <laughs> right, right. We don't have to be bitten by the snake right. and feel the pain to learn that snakes are scary. We could just watch someone else get bitten by yeah, a snake. Yeah. And, and in the same way, we could also look at the, at the perpetrator right. and go, well, and I, and I don't think we usually think of that. You know, it's just yeah. like, well, when we're two or three or four, we're not like discriminatory about who yeah. we're downloading into our head, right? Yep. So if you have a psychopath <laughs> and a sadist, like a, a father, and they're exhibiting this behavior repetitively, you're like, oh, that must be pleasurable. I I will associate what they just did, even if it was to me. Even if I'm crying, yeah. But I'll associate that behavior that they did as a as something that will derive pleasure and those things will get actually yeah. wired together. Right, which is what you were describing that is insane to think that I, you would think that the lesson I would have learned would have been, oh, that's horrible to do to a little child. I will never do that. <laughs> right. But that's only looking at one side. Right. Our side, you know, for the victim, yeah, yeah. we're just focusing on, and you are, you are right, encoding yeah. that, but you're also, you're looking at the person. Yeah, you know, another thing that's often said is a sort of a, a sort of a subclass of this is that when we feel powerless and a psychopathic sadist, par- sadist parent's going to make you feel fairly powerless, right? You're always looking for power. You're always looking for some way to get to power. And if the most powerful person in your house is the psychopathic sadist, mm. then you will learn to be like that. You'll, yeah. you'll, you'll mimic, ironically, the person that makes you feel powerless, you will end up mimicking them sometimes. You know what I mean? Oh, actually, that was something I was going to add, that to add to all of this observ- observation, observations these little kids were doing in those households, there was also the sex of the people involved, the the common notion in, in these households as described in the documentary is that men like rule the house mm-hmm. with an iron fist <laughs> both literally and figuratively and it's all like the way they talk about him when he was born he was like the the royal heir it's the line of succession and it's just like this line of men men are in power men are in, and that i i think reinforces the whole thing it's like oh i'm a man And this is what I do. And that is how I have to behave because I am a man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So getting back to my key differences of love bombing. (laughs) Number So number one is they respond well to your boundaries. That's actual love, not love bombing love. Number two is their love is unconditional rather than mean conditional. Number three is they respond relatively well to your criticisms. So if you criticize them and be like, wow, you're really into BDSM, aren't you? You know, relatively well, they'll respond to that. Uh, whereas someone who's love bombing is fairly, you know, if, if they're an abuser and if, if they're conscious of what they're doing to you, they're often doing it be- because they want to have the upper hand. And so if you're criticizing them, that challenges that and they'll attack it. Or if they're doing the more subconscious version of, of love bombing, they're doing it because they're running away from a massive insecurity. Mm-hmm. And if you criticize them, they might actually explode with, at you. Um, and number four is you, in regular healthy love, you won't have a deep down fear of them. And this is actually the key. And we talked about this earlier when Courtney was saying when she was stepping away from him for a time, mm-hmm. she would have this pit in her stomach. She would have this this fear. And and I, I think it's very important for people to listen to this gut feeling because I use this feeling when I'm assessing my own clients. Mm-hmm. You know, they're... Most people with narcissism or histrionic or borderline or, or psychopathy for that matter or paranoid or depend or even dependent passive aggressive even dependent personality individuals I've experienced maybe all the personality disorders but a good number of them they don't present with those disorders they don't sit down and say I have dependent personality disorder or I have passive aggressive yeah. personality they present as I'm depressed or my partner sucks or you know I I'm I'm highly anxious. It's another thing you'll hear. And you might I might work with someone for months before there's any indication to me that would 
lead me down a road of like, oh, are we talking about this? But what I will detect very early on is that fear in my stomach. Mm. I will, I, and when I've, and I've learned that enough times that there's a feeling I get and it's not supernatural. No, it's a, <laughs> it's a felt, my body, you know, we perceive a lot of things, sure. not just the, the conscious things. We're perceiving what I believe to be subtle indications of safety or danger. And what my body is picking up on is a subtle onslaught of, uh, of indications of, of danger, of threat. Yeah. Like with Army Hammer, for example, the way that Courtney and others were talking about him, there's love, 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 compliment, 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 attention, 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 uh, praise, 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 plans, plans, plans. But their body is probably picking up on the fact that it's at no point is he saying, am I going too fast? Right. <laughs> At no point is he saying, you know, I'm kind of into BDSM, but I don't want to bother you. You yeah. know, at, at no point is he giving any indication of flexibility or what do you want to do? <laughs> it, there's, it's, it's all in his world. So it, it, if you're tricked by the verbalness and the consciousness and what's on the surface, you'll go along with it because you're like, this is exactly what, he's, he's checking all the boxes, but your body is noticing there's not a lot of option for me, you know? Yeah. I, or or even say you just do something subtle, like you look at your phone, like he's glomming onto her and she looks at her phone for half a second and he kind of intervenes. He's like, hey, let's go. And, and your body kind of picks up on this fact that you, you took a little bit of attention away from him and some kind of anxiety came from him. So yeah. it wasn't necessarily control, but it, it felt mild anxiety. And whether you consciously register or not, your body recognized like you shifted away from the stimulus for half a second and instantly like it stepped in front of your face again and grabbed your attention. Like there, this is, it's a claustrophobia feeling, you know? So when I work with people after the first few years of working with these individuals, and it was really helpful because I, and, I, and, it, and it's subtle, but to know to or and I would never know, you know, if I have the feeling, sure. I'm just like, well, maybe it's indigestion. Who knows? But it's but, like one data point. <laughs> but it's an important data point because what it would help me do is avoid stepping on a landmine. Because sure. when you are unaware of someone with a moderate to severe personality disorder, and you just sort of proceed with therapy as as usual, you will inevitably step on <laughs> some sensitivity of their, of theirs that and they will massively distort things and then they could literally terminate with you and get lawyers and sue you because Jeez. they just became yeah. you know uh semi delusional in that moment i don't use that word lightly because it can happen and so it'd be nice to know <laughs> that right. those lands those landmines exist and if you have any way of picking up on it then you know you want to utilize that one thing that occurs to me i've been rewatching the the Pablo Escobar Colombian production and Obviously, it's just a recreation, but there's also a lot of footage that you can find of Escobar talking uh, and actually being being interviewed and when he was in the Senate in Colombia and stuff like that. And there is something really unnerving about his affect. Now, granted, it's the benefit of hindsight, but but it is weird. And, you, and I, I do get that sense that like from all the accounts, he could appear like, you know, the nicest guy. But if you cross him in just the wrong way, your world literally comes to a screeching halt and in, in vicious, violent, bloody ways, right? Yeah. And that's, an, that's like an extreme. But So I can imagine someone maybe not as extreme, but still like where if you just say the wrong thing, you're, you're done in their book. Right. And if you aren't used to this kind of interaction, you might it might happen so quick or so or in the midst of all these other things that you would code as being positive that you don't know that you're in a dangerous yeah. abusive situation or, or it's not headed in that direction you know the average human being even people who are fairly educated on the topic don't necessarily know the true signs of the beginning of an abusive relationship you know Course, yeah. especially because it's not taught that's why i wanted to talk about this whole love bombing thing and how it was for courtney and others because 
I feel like these documentaries miss an opportunity the way that the Tinder swindler did well. Right. You know, it yeah. actually, like, you walk away from that going like, whoa, like, anyone could have been. Yeah. That, that could have happened. That could have been me. I mean, how would you possibly know? Absolutely. And that's a really good point. That that feeling of that could have been me. And you almost have the steps laid out for you, you know, whereas here it's right. Like if you didn't know better and know better by having seen enough of these things or kind of being a little bit more aware of how manipulative people can be, you might see some of that and be like, well, I mean, why did you go back? Or why did you go on that trip? Or why did you, after those text messages, why did you do blah, right? Like, yeah. Because yeah. literally, you're in love. And two, 99.99999% of what you have consciously registered and, and encoded as memory was not only positive, but extremely positive. She said she's, she had never been happy, had never felt happier. Yeah. She has that picture. She's like, in this moment, I just, I had never been happier. And yeah. I really felt it. Tinder know? swindler victim yeah. said the same thing. I, yeah. Especially that first one. She's like, I had never felt that good in a relationship. Yeah as I did in that moment. And that's indicative of both the conscious love bombing and the subconscious love bombing. The conscious love bombing, it's like, well, they're manipulating you and they know how to do it. Yeah. But the subconscious one as well, you know, the when someone is all gooding you, and, you know, to broaden it out, it can happen to therapists. So yeah. this is something that is well known in the treatment of borderline and or disorganized attachment is that for some of these individuals, they will all good you as a therapist. Yeah. They'll praise you. Oh, okay. Wow, I've never had such disclosure with someone, blah, yeah. blah, blah. I've had 10 other therapists. Yeah. No one listens to me the way you do. No one is as smart yeah. as you. I, I've never, uh, you know, progressed so quickly in therapy before. And it's not false. It's just important as a clinician to understand that emotionally for you, you should be careful. Because what will happen to the therapist is that they'll let their guard down. Right. And they'll start to even crave seeing that client because they make them feel good and crave the opinion of the client, right? As mm -hmm. anyone would, it's just human to do so. Because when it turns and you become all bad, it, it can be particularly damaging to you sure. as a therapist, not only just for your own sanity, but yeah. also because it will give a lot greater challenge to managing your kind of transference, which you really have to do when you work Jeez. with these individuals. Because when they turn on you, you could say, terminate with them because you hate them so much or, or you just make up a clinical idea. Well, they're not ready for therapy. so I mean, And it's critical that you don't do that because these individuals need long-term care in spite of their frequent testing of their relationship to right. make sure that it's a secure one. Let's take another break, Berta, and we get back uh, I have a few things to, I feel like every episode Berta we do I'm always like yeah this you know be about 45 minutes and I always I, and, and we're not even like halfway through minutes but I don't want to string this out any longer so I just have to get to a couple points okay All right, we're back from the break. So I feel like we're not getting to a lot of the things I wanted to get to. So we have sadism, which is the pleasure of other people's pain. There's sexual sadism, which I think he allegedly had both and then there's psychopathy so you can have sadism right you can qualify for someone that has a significantly excessive problematic desire for other people's pain and the pleasure of it but you could also with that personality disorder not be a psychopath meaning that you do have empathy for other people and there are documented cases like this and it makes sense these individuals have a, a choice at some point to either go down a road of sadism or not because they don't they don't want to harm other people but if your sadism is so strong people will end up making justifications to themselves it's just like well it doesn't really harm them or or they might harm animals instead you know right. and, and say to themselves the animals don't really have feelings like that. and then there's psychopathy which is different from sadism but you can have both psychopathy complicated generally speaking you don't have empathy yeah. or remorse you so you wouldn't even be trying to make that rationalization in your head. You just did what you did. If you're a psychopath, if you're and, a psychopath and a sadist, and a sadist, right? You wouldn't be sitting here trying to like justify it. No, you would just be like, well, that's what I do. It doesn't matter. I don't. Yeah. I don't even register. Yeah. I get off on their pain, but I don't register that it means anything. Yeah. It's it's as if they just told me that they had a, a cheese sandwich yesterday. 
And that brings and, me pleasure. <laughs> and, and who cares? Like, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. And so now, of course, you can be a psychopath without, without being a sadist. So you can be a psychopath and not have remorse and also not harm other people because... That doesn't bring you pleasure. It, well, it does. Not only does it not bring you pleasure, but it also isn't instrumental to you. Sure. You know, psychopaths who are not sadists will harm others when other people get in their way. Sure. It, but if you don't get in their way, they don't... They don't want to harm you. And there are plenty of people who know that they're psychopaths and actually have figured out how to intellectually protect other people from them. You know, they're just like, okay, I have to. Oh, you're talking about Dexter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my hypothesis about Dexter is that he wasn't actually a psychopath, that he was actually replaying a traumatic event yeah. from his, you know. Which, by the way, that that's like when you're like, well, I mean. What, so someone makes an allegation about some supposed text messages? No, tons of people with the receipts to show it and marks on their bodies and, you know, corroborating one another's stories and even to the point of like, no, also took me here, also did this, also did... Mm -hmm. This isn't just like some he said, she said bullshit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also in my notes, and this is a, to the first episode from a year and a half ago, I think it's called Army Hammer and Vor Fetish or something. We go into a lot about Vor because a lot of the headlines, especially in the yeah. beginning, was like, he's a cannibal. He's like Hannibal Lecter. People are making all these jokes about it. And we reviewed the whole thing last time, but just in brief, there is a thing, Vor Fetish or Vorophilia, in which people have an erotic desire to consume or be concerned could be consumed by another person or creature or watch people eat or watch people get eaten. Now, the key is, is with vor fetish is that it's always consensual and it's never actually eating other people. <laughs> um, although there was one famous story of a German man, two men consented. Yeah, yeah, the one man wanted to actually be killed and eaten and the other man actually wanted to eat someone. But that, you know, that's, and, and that actually happened. And I don't know the outcome of that legally, but the point is, is that's, that's pretty rare. Uh, the vast, vast majority of people who are into war, it's similar to BDSM. It's like they don't, people into BDSM don't actually want to be uh, raped or tied up and, and harmed or beaten to a pulp. Uh, it's all play. And with war, it's the same way. It's, it, you're playing out this fantasy in your mind. Uh, a more common thing that people will probably relate to is you're having your regular very calm vanilla sex with your partner and there's a little bit of dirty talk right yeah <laughs> like what would be a low-grade dirty talk utterance okay. while you're in bed with someone i would love it if you would just kind of like like flick your pinky in my elbow pit <laughs> No, no. Give me a, give me a, a beat a, on you know the first the, step of BDSM. Oh, or, sure, sure. Or vor. like I don't know. Can you spank me a little bit? You know. No, oh, that's not Is that too mild. Berto, you're not you're not turning me on. The the thing that I I would say that what I'm trying to get at is a statement like I was trying to avoid making the statement because people see me as Mr. Rogers sometimes. So you don't want your Mr. Rogers people saying, but I will. I'll, Let's I, hear. I need it. we need to break people. Let's of, hear of that it. Notion anyway. Although, isn't it funny to think, you know, because Mr. Roger, Mr. Rogers had kids, so yeah. you got to figure. He, he was, had sex. Who knows what he was he like. He was probably pretty kinky. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if the puppets ended up in bed. Oh, oh why am oh, I doing that? no. Um, <laughs> anyway, so something along those lines that maybe is more common that people can relate to is like, I'm going to give it to you or something. You know? Sure. Turn over. I'm going to give it to you. Okay. Okay. So but, if you just take that at its verbatim and even the tone of it. Yeah. It sounds violent. It sounds, sounds violent. It sounds non-consensual. It, yeah. It's not like, would you like me to give it to you? Sure. It's turnover. I'm going to give it to you, right? Yeah. Now, there's not a rapey sense to that, but you could imagine going further down the road. Okay. Sure. So that's the same. That's BD, So further down the road with BDSM, further down the road with war is a, a more common thing that people can relate to is you'll hear people say this. It's like, oh my God, he's so cute. I just want to, I just want to eat him up. Yeah. Or oh my God, she is, she is juicy. I mean, yeah. she's sweet and tasty. Sure. You know, we use these terms and there's a lot of songs about it. You know, hungry like the wolf, I'm on the hunt. Juice is like wine, I'm hungry. And then of course, with religion, you are literally eating the flesh of Christ. <laughs> there's many myths involving this. Kronos ate Zeus's siblings. Uh, there's a lot of uh, fairy tales about this, you know, like, Little Red Riding Hood, Hansel, Hansel Red. We clearly have like an element of this in our culture and in our psyches and taken to an extreme is more of the vor fetish, right? So it's just a, it's just a greater degree of 
that and and it can manifest in a lot of different ways so here's the question actually and i i, I don't the, for the, the first episode we did i was like well he clearly has a war fetish and maybe a bdsm fetish but he's also an abusive person so we don't want to yeah. equate vor and bdsm although with abuse. i i believe i made the point and if i didn't i should have because i still feel this way that i'm not totally on board with all fetishes go and vor is included mm. because as an ex i think i gave this example like, what if my, you know, fetish thought is to, like, you know, kill a whole bunch of people, right? Like, and I just fantasize about it all the time. Well, that can lead me down some pretty destructive paths, right? The research on that is is not strong either direction. So, it's... But, but we have plenty of real-life evidence of kids who fantasize about it, plan it, and then do it. Because they actually wanted to do it. Right. But, I mean, they said they wanted to do it. But when you catalog right. all the different fantasies that people have, yeah. e- even if we just look sexually, yeah. and, this, and this is doesn't even include like the pleasure that people get from killing a thousand people playing a video game, right? So, well, so they're any not, right? They're they're just they're well, just, they're just thoughts in your head. They're just they're just they're not plans. Like most statistics show that half of women, when polled, have had fantasies that periodically about being raped. Do they want to be raped? No, of course not. Sure, that's but ridiculous. that's also about something that they want done to them. I, I don't want to get into this because we'll just, we'll just end up talking forever. I don't want to talk about this anymore. But we'll agree to disagree. The research okay. shows that there's no clear evidence showing that anything along these lines, like playing video games, causes people to want to kill people. Or Agreed. having a, a war fetish causes people to want to actually eat people. Or having a BDSM fetish leads to people actually want well, I, now, I would, can can yeah. someone be a sexual sadist and a criminal and also be into BDSM or VOR or video games? Yeah. But there's uh, no way you have VOR stats. No one's got VOR statistics. You know what I mean? What? Like, the the people that are into VOR are so there's the percentage is so small. There's no way we actually have statistics on how many people had the fantasies, had the opportunity to we carry do. them out and then did it. But I mean, like, you know, with pedophiles, it's like they fantasize about things that they want to do. And it and it's unfortunately pretty likely that if given the opportunity, they do it. And no, then, that's actually you know, you know false. I mean? That's false. Well, but well, fine. But enough percentage of them do it that it's a problem. So gun, if it goes unnoted or untreated or un, undealt with, it's a problem for society. Is it true that for some criminals, they will fantasize and they need to be dealt with in some way, shape, or form, treated, locked up, something, prevented from having access to victims. And the slippery slope towards victimization of other human beings begins with what one could call fantasy or thoughts of. The thought of wanting to sexually harm a child. It starts out as a fantasy, and then it grows to actual behavior. Does that happen? Yes, it's almost universal along those lines. Right. And there are many people, without getting into pedophilia, because I don't want to get bogged down in that, who will have a variety of sexual fetishes, all of which, if you just looked at it on its face, are deplorable actual human activity, criminal human activity. But the vast, vast majority of people who participate in those fantasies never would want to do these things in real life. So to equate just because war fetish makes you feel uncomfortable with somehow it needs to be labeled differently than other fetishes is just another example of sexual shaming in our, in our society, in my opinion, bro. Well, let's move forward. So after watching this documentary and seeing his generational sadism and psychopathy, it makes me wonder if he was actually, if he actually had a vor fetish. Because like one of the things that is confusing for some people is that if you do have a child abuser, sexual child abuser, they will equate it with pedophilia. And it's fine depending on what we mean by pedophilia, because for some people, for many people that sexually harm children, they're not attracted to children. They just want to harm anyone. And children are just very susceptible and to sexually harm is just one way to harm people now certainly some people who harm children actually want to have sex with children right that's their that's what they're oriented towards but i'm wondering for and there's no way to know and there's not strong evidence in this direction but it's possible that army hammer he just wanted to scare and harm people and he manifested in a variety of ways 
and he found that if he did BDSM, he could utilize that to harm. And if he and he found if he could do the vor, he could live in that world. Then he could just utilize that to harm. It's 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 hard to know, right? That is true. I, I I just think like in the exchanges that you see evidenced that they show. Basically, if I were giving advice to someone, is if in your exchange with someone romantically, it gets to the point where they're discussing that they would like to decapitate you and or you know you know blow up a, a church with you inside of it, like. I would, but that's not actually I would do something about that. Okay. Um, yes. And he was saying, like, I want to cook part of it. I want to take out your organs. I want to, well, like, he was saying those things. But when you Whether actually. Whether he means it or not, I, t- I still see that as a flat. Decapitate, yeah, but that's not vor. So. No, no I know. I'm, vor, just, I'm just saying, I wasn't giving that vor example. I was giving an extreme. Yeah, but I want to delineate. Extreme. I want to delineate because the. The typical vor fetish manifestation is one, shame. People are terribly ashamed of it. Two, it'll manifest in a variety of different ways. But one of the common behaviors that people will land on is that someone has a massive vor fetish. And so they're obsessed with fantasizing or kind of paying attention to their partner's stomach. And, you know, and so they, they kind of want to be inside of their partner's stomach. They don't actually want to be eaten. They... And they know, you know, physically it's impossible for them to live inside their partner's stomach. And this is just one type, subtype of yeah. war. And they will love to listen to the sounds of their partner's stomach. And it will be either just generally comforting or, or a sexual turn on. That's what vor fetish is. <laughs> yeah. And what you just described sounds you know, odd, but not necessarily like a red flag to me that that in fact because two reasons that's one, what i'm saying they that's want it done fetish. to them but they want it done to them well even right? if they wanted their partner inside of them they would they would say i want to eat right. food off right. of right. you but that's not what he was saying right he was saying extreme things it, according to right now in september of 2022 it's still under investigation in los angeles no charges are filed though but and but many experts are saying that he never will be charged because the evidence isn't very strong which is upsetting because you have a number of people who have claimed especially that one woman who said she was raped for four hours like what else do you need anyway so the group of people that are maybe bringing that that rotten tomatoes audio score down they are called the charmies Oh, right, right. They mentioned that in the documentary, the Charmies. Right. So what is your, what was your, so I had to look into, so the more I looked into these people, I was like, huh? So what's your, what was your impression of them? Well, I, they didn't go into detail, but it seems like uh, the equivalent of the diehard fans of Britney or of any other celebrity. Yeah. In this case, it's of Army Hammer. <laughs> that's what I thought, but that's not what it is. Well, that's not what it is. I mean, it's close, okay. but it's, it's not like... So as far as I can tell, there were, you know, when Call Me By Your Name came out five years ago. Which I still haven't seen. Beautiful movie. Okay. I thought it was, it's, it has some real, and looking it, back now. It's, it's a gay relationship, right? Him yeah. and this other dude. Okay. Him and Timothy Chalamet. The, the movie has so many memorable scenes that when I look back on it, especially the sec, because there's some pretty explicit sexual encounters between these two actors i don't know how to describe it it it's just so emotionally moving and the aesthetic is just really particular but knowing what we know about army hammer now and looking back at the movie it really changes things a lot but anyway the point is is that i think there were a lot of people that watched call me by your name mm-hmm. you know of course there's a lot of movies depicting gay and lesbian bisexual relationships in a in a positive light but call me by your name was so beautiful mm-hmm I think it really moved a lot of people, people who wanted this to be true for themselves or, or something, or, or it, 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 it also carries with it a, a forbiddenness, you know, a I kind see. of Romeo and Juliet because they had to hide. There's also an, a pretty big age difference because the mm-hmm. Army Hammer plays a friend of Timothy Chalamet's father. And I think, oh, okay. and I think Timothy Chalamet's character is in high school or uh, it's pretty young. Anyway. Right. Wait, how come there was an outrage about that one? Uh, and there was outrage about the pineapple pizza or the yeah. whatever pizza. I, I don't know about the Timothy Chalamet character's age. Okay. Point is, is, at first I'm like, oh, maybe there are a lot of gay, maybe young gay men, boys, who see this movie and they live in a town where they can't 
express themselves, and so this movie really touches them. And I thought, oh, okay, makes sense. But reportedly, according to people who observe the Charmies, most of the fans, if not all of, well, not all of them, but the vast majority are, are reportedly young women. Okay. So you're like, okay, and they are essentially of the shipping community. So okay. they, they're shipping. Uh, Army Hammer and Timothy Chalamet in real life. Oh, I see. They have a fantasy that these two actors are mm-hmm. actually in love with each other and having yeah. sex with each other. And you're like, huh? Okay. <laughs> like, do you not understand this is acting? <laughs> People should have a license. You should have to get licensed to watch movies and enjoy life. <laughs> <laughs> or just be on the internet or to think or something. But over time, in spite of just droves and droves of evidence, including, I think, even statements by the two of them, uh-huh. because I think they've actually had to respond to these communities. Okay. <laughs> um, they believe and believe and believe. It's it's like a QAnon community where right. everything's a conspiracy. Everything's proof of the conspiracy. <laughs> right. And they've harassed Army Hammer's wife. Oh, my gosh. They've harassed Timothy Chalamet's dating partners. Uh. They've, like ganged up on these people saying like oh, how dare no. you we know you're you know a crisis actor or something oh my god that kind of crap and so uh, i didn't know about this community so when so this was all existing well before army hammer's allegations was coming out the toxicity and the horribleness was happening totally independent of any attack to mm. army hammer the allegations come out about and you know mm. that these victims coming forward are going to be attacked. I'm surprised they didn't mention anything about this in the documentary. Well, they did a little bit. You know, the Courtney and one of the journalists was talking about... But they just mentioned the Charmies. I didn't right. remember them mentioning all this other stuff. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, the the main thing is that they're... Well, right. So I it is, it is just kinda, assumed it, it's like his fans. Right. It is materially different, right? You know, it's one Very thing if so. you have fans of Army Hammer that are just sort of rational, you know, individuals, generally speaking, and they're just sort of convinced, you know, right. like. Which is, it's bad enough that you will disregard everything just because you're a fan of someone. Right. But then there's levels to this. Right. <laughs> it's sort of like fans of Amber Heard, fans of Johnny Depp, super fans of, of Woody Allen, right? It. it, it and then you have even different things like fans of Ted Bundy who are aware of the crimes and embrace the crimes, right? Right. Like there's, but this one is also a different variant. Like, okay. Or even better yet, like Elliot Roger. Right. Right, that right. kind of thing. Um, but the way they depicted it is just like super fans. But when you hear the actual story, you're like, oh, these people are actually like, they're not well. I mean, the fact right. that you would actually th- delusionally think that characters in a movie are real because you want it to be so is yeah. obviously there's something wrong with your brain. <laughs> um, so so these people, they were, they were defending Army Hammer when the allegations was coming out. They were attacking the victims of journalists, doxing the victims, death threats. And Berto... Do you know anything about the criminality or the because like you know of course I've been noted I've known about online harassment yeah. by groups for many many you know for a number of years but I hear about it more and more often and I think the most hated man on the internet that documentary about Hunter Moore you know because originally when he came out it wasn't illegal to to do revenge porn it wasn't illegal right. to non consensually post a picture a digital picture of someone's naked yeah. body. Um, it wasn't illegal because we we hadn't faced that scenario yet. It hadn't well, been a thing. And and at the time, people just were like, "Well, that's just the way it is." Right. I mean, you know, you took a picture of yourself, you put out, you 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 emailed it to yourself, like you, you deserve, gave away your rights. You yeah, you gave away your right. Now you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that would agree with that. Why? Right. Because the facts aren't different. We've changed our culture. We've right. woken up to how deplorable and how criminal this is. But we haven't done it with harassment. We right? haven't done it with online group no. harassment. No. And I find it to be just complete bullshit. It is completely baffling, dude. Take something like swatting. Yeah. Um, I, you should go away for life if you, so, if you swat, because you could literally <laughs> kill someone. And people have been killed right. when you swat. If people don't know what swatting is, it's when you call the police and you claim that someone is under has a bomb is holding someone yeah. hostage is something terrible and it requires a SWAT team yeah and and they know exactly what to say because there are there are you know guides online about the key words that you have to use 
because if the police just showed up, it would be one thing. But but when SWAT shows up, they typically don't knock on the door; they just bust in, right? Yeah. And so and so people think it's funny because uh, when someone's live streaming, they'll SWAT someone that they maybe don't like or they're just playing a prank, and they think it's funny when the SWAT team shows up during the live stream. And there have been cases of people being killed because yeah. the SWAT team comes in expecting there to be a bomb or a, or a shootout or something. And, you know, hot under the collar, itchy trigger finger cops just rolling into your house. It's, you know, mistakes are going to be made and, and they have. And and by the way, like, so... Uh, and the fact that the police and the SWAT teams are so gullible in my mind. I'm just like, are you that stupid? Well, it, it gets even worse. Uh, Philip DeFranco was talking about someone who's a, a, a popular streamer yeah. who has been swatted countless times yeah. and has been told, because he's asked the police, like, what can I do? Yeah. And the police has given them a number, like here, uh, here's the number. And Call me like, the next time. And, and he's like, listen, my cameras are live. You can check my stream anytime. Yeah. And they still show up. And then when he brings it up, they're like, I don't know. I don't know who you talk to. Yeah. It, it's unbelievable. And so I, I started thinking about that. I'm it makes me wonder, I mean, this is sort of sidetracked, but it makes me wonder if the SWAT guys get off on just having an opportunity to be SWAT guys. I mean, there is part of that, but honestly, there's got to be a limit to it. Like when you are when you know that, well, it's that house, we're not going to get to shoot someone because we know it's not. But to kick down a door, especially if you know it's a fake situation because you know you're not actually in danger, you got to play, you got to play SWAT, you know, you know how many... Uh, war reenactors there are and like weekend warriors who dress up and all I mean, sorts of stuff and I, paint paintball people who think they're actually at war like I could also see uh, some sort of legal advice uh, inside the police station saying hey listen here's the deal we miss one of them and it's it's like crazy scandal like if one of them is real we're, we're screwed right so they have to treat every threat as if it were real okay but then there's limits to that right you, you say but listen start a registry so, like, these are popular live streamers in your area yeah. that will be swatted, yeah. right? Or have been or swatted, have been swatted numerous times. Flag you that can house. Check their cameras. If yeah. it looks like their camera's not on and they're being swatted, great, go. Yeah. <laughs> the online harassment, and I, and I, I knew it was deplorable before. I felt it was deplorable before. I've been through enough situations, you know, more commonly where someone's being stalked. You know, like yeah. you have a woman who is being stalked by her ex-boyfriend and because the ex-boyfriend never does anything explicitly illegal he's allowed to terrorize this woman yeah. you know forever yeah. and i just feel like that's you know because of freedom of speech and freedom of movement you know through public spaces i i just feel like is that the kind of world we want to live in you know it, I, I just which, feel which is by the way the kind of world where criminals are the ones that would be able to take advantage of the loopholes. Right. It's because essentially normal taking people are never looking around for loopholes. <laughs> no, right. And and so I feel like this sort of thing should just be massively illegalized, you know. The and it, it wouldn't be that hard. Yep, you, you pass a law and then, you know, you could use IP addresses. I mean right. at the very least you can shut down websites that yeah. that are clearly allowing people to uh, coordinate their bullying attacks. I already hated it, but after going through the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial, a, a mild version of this happened to me, and yeah. I can't imagine going through a more severe version of this because the mild version of it, I couldn't sleep at night. Yeah, I mean, I thought about: Do I buy a gun? Yeah. Do I move? <laughs> do I do do I have to take my family to my parents' house because? Yeah. Because I was giving my my clinical opinions oh about about a trial, and and I was literally never saying anything definitively about these individuals. Because of that. Because of that, this this you must pay. This online group decides that they want to actually harm me in my life, like, and and I that was mild compared to what these people are going through. You know, with the Charmies, it's like, you know, and, and of course you think about the Sandy Hook parents and what they were going through yeah. and I just feel like that should just be made illegal and then people will stop doing it. How many revenge porn sites are there right now, Berto? <laughs> None. <laughs> they don't exist anymore yeah. because 
it imagine was that you uh, pass a law and you enforce it imagine if it wasn't illegal yeah it would still be happening yeah so what if we made this illegal and then it stopped <laughs> <laughs> like what freedom would we lose right you can criticize someone you can speak out against them you could say i think that person is lying you could say that person is uh, irresponsible or stupid or you could say all sorts of things you can't band together as a group to try to terrorize and harm them <laughs> you know yeah that's a there's a pretty like i can honestly say in all of my online travels i have criticized online many many people i whether big or small i've never gotten together with a group of people to see if i can actually actually harm other individuals yeah, yeah. In the, in the public but man, sphere. this goes along with the theme I was saying earlier. I believe <laughs> that if you, even just on a one-on-one, -on -one, let alone a group basis, if you are on a chat channel and you tell someone that you want to kill them, that should be illegal. Yeah. Even though they're just fantasizing about it. <laughs> but it's basically one of those like, you just can't cross some lines. Yeah. It's like, well, it's my freedom of speech. No. It is not. It is you infringing on someone else's freedom to be safe. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So a couple of the Rotten Tomatoes audience negative reviews. I thought I'd read them because I think this is what a lot of... So I think that there's those of the Charmies, but then I think there's also the anti-Me Too people and also just maybe the pro Army Hammer people. Quote, this documentary was completely biased. It was filled with kink shaming and accusations that were never proven true. In fact, the main girl is now in hot waters because the photo she provided as evidence was a Pinterest tattoo. So just chiming in here. I'm not sure what they're referring to, but I think they're referring to Paige Lorenz. She was the one who had the A etched in her body and she took a picture of it. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, in fact, that girl is now in hot water because the photo that she provided as evidence was a Pinterest tattoo. So I think according to them, they're claiming that that wound in her body that has an A is some photograph she got from online from Pinterest. on Pinterest and she just claimed it was her body with A. It's just like, huh? <laughs> like, did you read his texts? Have you heard even right. what he's... Okay. And it, LMAO, you can't make this stuff up. We are never presented with any evidence he ate anyone. It still doesn't make him a cannibal Wait, though. What? Yeah. Who was saying he is? <laughs> right. Yeah. That was, Actually, the whole point of this documentary was he's not a cannibal. Was that this wasn't about cannibalism? They kept right. saying this over and over. Yeah. Everyone focused on the cannibalism, right? And they forgot the important point. He was a he was a he psychopathic, was sadistic, abusive right. individual. Yeah, had, had nothing to do with cannibalism. Yeah. That now, is such a straw man. Like you set up this straw man. Look at this straw man, and look, I can beat it to to death. <laughs> yeah. Multiple people coming forward with the exact same story, claiming abuse from this individual who, in his own words, through text and even in interviews, claims that he is into this sort of thing. Uh, what more do you need? Another person. People can't have fantasies. I thought society is telling people to be who they want to be, and they will not be judged. Now it seems we should keep everything to ourselves because if we tell people how we really feel, we... <laughs> Another straw man. These are wonderful straw men. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is what I got from this. Uh, it's, like, it's like watching a documentary about Ted Bundy. And be like, people can't wear, wear turtlenecks? Right. So where are we going as a society? Yeah, what's wrong? Uh, by the way, this next sentence is one of those run on with sentences with no punctuation that's so Berto, tell, you're online a lot. <laughs> Do you, have you seen a larger incidence of people, even I think educated people on Twitter, on Instagram, posting words, like it'll be three sentences, but there will be no period or comma or indication that they're switching to a new phrase or anything. Do you know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. I, so I will say the following. Uh, I tend to use this, I, I call it like uh, ironic laziness, but not the run on sentences. I just do things like I don't capitalize le uh, words. I might omit commas altogether, things like that when I'm doing text messages, you know. Well, but if I was writing like a public post or certainly writing an article or something, of course I would write properly. Me, I, mean, I'm, I want to make sure that you understand what I'm asking. So let me read this sentence yeah, yeah. and because I see people who 
I think are educated, even I think famous people, and they will make posts like this. So just listen to this. Leave people alone and come on. This was right in the middle of COVID. Seriously, how many other people out there in the world did other things to keep from going insane? That's three different. Yes. There should be two period. There should be three periods. It should be leave people alone, maybe comma, and and, and come on, comma. This was right in the middle of COVID, period. Seriously, I guess, comma or period. How many other people out there in the world did other things to keep from going insane so leave people alone and come on this was right in the middle of covid seriously how many you know, like there's because when you read this in your head you're like what it's just because of the forum it, it is it, it is this ironic laziness like basically they're saying yes i know i could make these into sentences but what am i writing an essay for school this but it makes a public it post. illegible i have to I, read I the sentence five times to I, be like I, oh i, I see <laughs> that was a new idea because they don't even yeah there's no indication because they're you know uh, leave people alone and come on this was and come on this was oh leave people alone and come on this was right in the middle of covid seriously how many it's quite possible COVID also, seriously how COVID seriously it, how what it is COVID quite possible they also just dictated it text to speech or but, speech to text <laughs> and so this commenter uh, and I'm leaving out the misspellings and stuff but I see like I'll see famous individuals sure be, and I, I get this impression they think it expresses urgency yeah it, it is again it is because of the medium they're not writing an essay it makes them I'm look not like justifying it I'm just saying yes it is a trend it is kind of like like, look, do we really need to, can we just dispense with the formalities here? <laughs> it, but it, what, what it tells, and maybe this is because I'm a professor and I'm, you know, snooty or something, but what it, what it expresses to me is they don't even really understand how to depict things in graphical form. And, you know, there, there's, there, because one of the things that I would see in very rare students, it was, it, you know, obviously these are graduate school students, but it would happen every once in a while, is people would write how they talk. Yeah. In hypothetical defense of some of these people, it, what they might say would be like, no, you're not very smart because you should understand what I'm saying anyways. Now, here's what I'll say. I do use punctuation always because it just makes sense. But I do get lazy with capital letters and with that was fine. You know, stuff like that. I don't need but, a capital to understand the beginning of a phrase. Yeah. Um, but I even heard some other people saying that if you use punctuation in a text, it's rude. <laughs> because you're trying to be so formal about it. No, not formal, <laughs> but it, it comes across like you're being angry. Well, the, it depends. Like, <laughs> but I, If I, you're making three sentences, that doesn't come off as angry. It, but maybe if you're like, uh, I, already, I, I already considered this, period. What I was trying to explain, you know, like, yeah, maybe that could come, you know. <laughs> I just don't, I don't understand. I mean, I'm, I know I'm old and crotchety and that's just the way it's going to be, but how else are you supposed to communicate the end of a phrase? No, but because, it's it's because nonsensical a, to not a, include some break. But there's a medium, a, a, an implication of the medium you're using. It's the reason why if you send a message with all caps, even though there's nothing intrinsically about capital letters that means that you're yelling at someone, it feels like you're yelling at them. When you so so this that, is an extreme but, but, that no but, one should defend. Yeah, but it's in the vein of not being rude yeah. taken to the extreme, well, or I, being lazy taken. Well, to the I don't extreme. like it, and I shake my fist at it. I, I do too. I think that that's dumb. That's An, too much. Another uh, sentence here. Also, what's the difference between his fantasies and Fifty Shades of Grey? There are people out, again. No, no. There are people out there who like to do other things than regular stuff in the bedroom. Straw men are awesome. If someone engages in conversations by liking or putting a heart by what you're talking about says, oh, so this is attacking Courtney for liking some of his initial texts when he's talking about BDSM, you know? Uh, To be clear, you remember that in the documentary? The thing she was liking, now she claims she's like, well, I was only liking it because I was just trying to say, okay, that's fun, even though I'm, I don't know if so I'm really So what if she was liking it because she was liking it? Right. Those texts were, um, he was expressing his kink and his fetish that he wasn't saying, I want to chop your head off and eat you, or I want to rape you for four hours. He was expressing 
what could be argued an invitation to his sexual pro- proclivities. There was no indication that it, at any point he was going to not listen to, to pushback, you know? So she could just be, you know, it'd be like if someone that you are attracted to, you know, they're just like, um, well, like with you, Berto, like you, I, I, I'm guessing you don't have a war fetish. So someone is you're flirting with and they're just like, I just want to fantasize about being in your stomach while we're having sex. You, you're going to be like, well, I can't relate to that. But but in your, if you're in the flirtation mode, you're, you're going to you're not going to put her down or no, say, no, like, I, what's I will the, add a little heart emoji as I report them to the authorities. <laughs> yeah, clearly. So, yeah, anyway, the defenders are basically strawmanning it and saying that uh, it's like Fifty Shades of Grey. But, but there are problems with Fifty Shades of Grey. For, I've never read it, but from, from what I've heard from people who have critiqued it, it's the book actually is not BDSM because there's not consent. Right. <laughs> but even, even that, so like, let's say they're, they're saying, oh, you know, so what, have, what about Fifty Shades of Grey? So my reply to their comment would be like, why are you claiming that Fifty Shades of Grey is the best movie ever and that you basically think it's even better than The Beatles? Because that's the kind of argument they're making. Yeah. Okay. So here's what I wanted to say for the beginning, really. And I just am so discombobulated this episode that it's just coming out now, which is that forget about the fact that this is a famous case. Forget about the fact that there's a vor fetish and there's BDSM and cannibalism and all those kinds of elements. What we should be focusing on is that yet another example is given to us, probably because it is famous, but this is uh, but one of millions of cases like this where you have someone who is utilizing their privilege and power to get away with harming people who don't have power, whether that's with gender or race or class or education level or whatever it is. When we stratify society and we set up a system that privileges those people with power, and that will, for a lot of people, not result in any direct harm like this. But for those who are harmed by people in power, they are not allowed to have justice. The people who will be perpetrating these crimes, the privileged will get away with it. We have a very clear example of that here, where you have four to five generations of crimes, of sadism, of harm, of abuse, of women, rape of women, harm to people around them, murder. You know, we didn't even get into that, that one of the individuals in this string of men, I think it would be Army Hammer's grandfather, literally got away with murder. So just because we managed to catch Army Hammer is but one person that we manage to catch and label. Think about all the other people that don't have newsworthy stories because they're not famous who are utilizing their power to get away with stuff stuff like this. You know, think of Harvey Weinstein. He utilized his power. Think of Bill Cosby. He utilized his power. And this happens all the time. So until we, as the people, dismantle this privilege, dismantle this in- inequity, and set up a system that actually serves justice and is not corrupt— is not allowed to be bought off. You know, we didn't even get into Nixon and George H.W. Bush and Prince Charles and how, you know, Armand Hammer, Army Hammer's great-grandfather, basically, because he was one of the richest men on the planet, he had the 16th, he was owner of the 16th most largest company in the world. He paid off politicians and, you know, public figures and um, to s- bribed people. There are recorded bribes that he did. Uh, He was actually convicted of illegally contributing to uh, Nixon, presumably to uh, help him get out of Watergate, that kind of thing. So until we address the system, which wouldn't be that hard to do, it's not, all you got to do is allow intelligent people to devise laws that won't, and and you also have to devise a a, a legislation system, a political law-making system and regulation system that cannot be corrupted by those in power, by those who have privilege. If we did that of the people, by the people, for the people, then we could actually eliminate a lot of the victimization that we see in this documentary. But we won't do that. In fact, it's getting worse, and more of these abuses are going to happen. Make no doubt about it. They're happening right now. People in privilege are getting away with all sorts of things in our society, and particularly when we include around the world. And so 
we, the people, devise our system. We make the rules. We vote for people. We can change things. This isn't out of our control. We're not talking about some alien race on high that makes our laws. No, we elect our officials. They are the ones who make the rules. We can change it, and we need to do that. We have to do it fast because things are spinning out of control. There's more inequity. There's more injustice. All right, Berto, so that's the end of that episode. Hey, I don't think this is the end of this story, so I wouldn't be surprised if we have yet another episode down the road. I hope that he actually is charged and convicted or tried, and then we'll see what the yeah. trier or fact will say. If these accusations are made, which they are, and there's, there should be a trial. Yeah, and if not, then I would hope that enough people will be aware of his issues that they will steer clear of him. And I hope that the victims feel supported and obviously not doxxed and attacked online and swatted. And also that all of us can be validated for what we went through to be taken care of and to get the help that we deserve, as we saw with Courtney. And that was actually a nice thing is, you know, when we talked about her a year and a half ago, she, I think, had just started therapy, but she hadn't really seen any benefits yet. But in this documentary, we hear that she really benefited from inpatient therapy. She actually went to a rehab center for a while yeah. and had what seems to be trauma treatment and really got the help that she needed. So, you know, that was, a, and I would hope that the others will get that as well. And from what I understand, the vast majority of the reactions to this documentary is one of, horror against army hammer and support for the victims because the you know the previous news stories there wasn't as much detail and there's something powerful about a documentary that really lays everything out and and by the way i as has been common now for the last n number of documentaries and things that i've been seeing i i also feel sadness incredible sadness for the little army hammer and for the kids that grew up in that family and for that that his aunt it's just like it's just a cycle mm-hmm. and it's both genetic and observed, but it's a cycle and it's horrible. Yeah. And it makes me so sad. Right. If, if a young army hammer had been born into a different family, even yeah. with the same genetics, I'm guessing things would have been very different. Yeah. All right, Birdo, let's say to everyone out there to please take care of yourself and take care of, take care of <laughs> others because you uh, deserve it.